We are now live, apparently. Hi, everyone. This is my first time being live, so I have no idea if I'm doing this correctly, but YouTube tells me I am live. And I can see some chats, so I guess I am. Hi, everyone. This is For the Love of Comics with our very first live stream. And I've just posted and shared to Facebook as well as the community tab. So the links are up. And hope everyone's having a great Sunday. I see, oh, there are a number of people on, which is great. I was a little concerned that this might be like one of those disastrous birthday parties they always talk about in movies and TV shows where no one shows up. But very happy to see everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Love classic comics. Yes, absolutely. Today is going to be a classic comics day. And I was I was wondering about um, what the subject for a good uh, live stream, our first live stream should be. And the reason why I picked the box sets and the classic comics is because they're usually going to be things that in some way, at least, uh, at least some of these are going to get uh, a special video uh, made dedicated to them or they're going to feature in a special video in which they're going to be showed off a little bit better but you know they're going to be in its particular area so we're looking at Archie we're looking at Mickey Mouse we've got Pogo we've got a couple of Karl Barks volumes uh, Donald Duck and Uncle Scrooge and uh, some very nifty books from IDW and any one of these could actually easily have a sort of spotlight uh, video or be featured in spotlight videos of their own. So this is going to be really more of a talk through of these things, of why I picked them up, of what's of interest to them, and uh, to see if that would be interest to you. Uh, I've also got the chat window up here. Hi. Hi, everyone. Oh, yeah, this is this is fantastic. I'm... This is great to be part of the first live chat. This is this is fantastic. I'm I'm having a great time already. I think I'm going to put this chat up on a bigger window. Just give me a second to pop it out into something a little larger. There we go. Sachin Verma, nothing. You've missed absolutely absolutely nothing so far. Um, just. Recapping what I'm going to be looking at today, and I thought I would go about this in sort of a chronological way. Not there's not really a direct plan on it. Uh, most of these things span a number of years, so we'll start somewhere, we'll go off into something else. But also, I'll keep checking the chat every now and then uh, to see what it is that you might want me to show you. Of course, as I was saying earlier. It's not going to be an edited video, and it's not going to be one of those top-down things. So I'm going to try to make sure that I can get some angles on this. But um, let's start by looking at these things, which were recommended to me by uh, one of the viewers of this channel. Uh, this, these are editions called uh, the Library of American Comics Essentials. And they're bringing out these volumes of newspaper strips collected uh, by strip and author um, in these essentials formats. Of course, the most striking thing about this, the thing that automatically, the first thing that catches your attention is, is the format. This incredible um, landscape format. And the reason why they're shaped this way is because they reproduce the newspaper strips one strip at a time. So let me try and get this exposed properly. Oh dear. It's maybe a little too much light for this, but it's basically, hmm, how am I going to show this properly? This shows, well, there you go. The first issue of the live stream is I'm not able to adjust this, but you, you get the idea somewhat that 
that this is one newspaper strip. And the idea behind it, and I was watching an interview uh, behind the designer of these volumes, is he collected these originals or the original facsimiles of these newspaper strips, cut them out of the newspaper, and then had them custom bound. And the reason why this is such an interesting way to read these newspaper strips in this format is because obviously when you read them in the newspaper, you don't read them as a book, you don't read them uh, from you know the top uh, left corner to the bottom right corner of a page. You read one vertical strip and then you wait for the next day's newspaper to read the next strip. So this replicates as closely as possible of following a strip over its serial publication in a newspaper, but doing it one strip at a time to where you have to turn the page or at least switch to the next page uh, to get to this. This is Baron Bean, a strip I had never heard of by George Herriman, who's obviously known for Crazy Cat and other comics, but I'm a big fan of Crazy Cat. I had never actually heard of Baron Bean, but this this is from 1916, so this is way back. Crazy Cat 1930s is when it started, so this is one of the precursors to his Crazy Cat strip uh, with Crazy and Ignatz, and George Herriman's Baron Beans Volume 1 is 1916. So each one of these volumes is one year of uh, dailies. Um, so these, these strips over here, and they come with a lot of extras. There are essays and little retrospectives, uh, little writings uh, that are formatted in this way to match you know the, the the design of it has been has been carried out to give you sample strips, things that came before and after, contextualizing what else was going on, what else like there are some crazy cat strips collected over here uh, by Herriman. Uh, and, and and these are beautiful, these are fantastic. Now I only picked up two of them: this one of uh, Baron Bean, and this one of the first year of Crazy Cat. going to try to frame this properly. And it's, uh, it's superb. I mean, if, even if you uh, think about how they're stored on a shelf, I did see in this, uh, in this video, which showed all of them, and I think there are about a dozen or more of these, and some of them are, I mean, most of them actually are comic strips I've not heard of, uh, but they're American comics, classic comics, newspaper strip comics being preserved for posterity as essential. So the volumes all start with the beginnings of the strips. So I think there'll be volume two of Crazy Cat, there'll be volume two of Bad and Bean, and that's the plan. So they'll go chronologically year by year for each of these series. But um, what I was saying is that the video that I watched had them stacked on top of each other, which makes on the bookshelf a long spine made up of two spines of these handsome hardcovers with ribbons. And it just looks, it looks beautiful. It looks classic, but it's also the kind of production. I mean, it's very unusual production and that's obviously one of the, the, the main draws, but the material in it is, is fantastic. The reproduction, the scans are very high quality. Uh, the uh, the readability of these i think it's it's better in this format because you're focusing on one strip you're reading one strip only so it's not like a big page and you can imagine if this was in um like one of those other collections of uh, classic comics like the fantagraphics reprints of crazy cat which i love but if you had six of these on a page or five of these on a page that would be a huge page so the pages are usually being shrunk to give you five of these strips on a page when they're at this size, they're actually larger per strip. So the font, um, you know, which could be a little hard to read because it's old type fonts and old type printing, it just makes it, it just makes it a fantastic reading experience. So I've really enjoyed reading Bad and Bean and revisiting some of these early crazy cats. I know that there are so many of these out there. Uh, I'm going to have to pick which one I, which one I want to get next. And, uh, you do need deep shelves for these, but I think as a 
preservation tactic. It's so unique because it is it is doing the kind of archival stuff that most of us um, want from publishers. Like, and that's one thing that you know, Sunday Press, Fantagraphics, they do so well that they take these sort of almost forgotten gems and 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 put them out in handsome volumes that that remind you about things uh, that used to be. I think this whole exercise is such a beautiful exercise, and they're not they're not very expensive. That's another surprising thing. At least I was able to pick up a couple of them for uh, less than $20, or maybe they were like $15 each, which I mean, I'm not saying that's cheap, but given the quality and given the fact that these are hardcover and given the quality of the paper and the binding and the kind of scholarship that you have around with it, and you might get lucky and find them on sale as well. So I thought that they were, they, they were terrific. I mean, I can just imagine someone building a library of these classic comics by collecting uh, every one of these volumes. Um, yes, they're called the LOAC Essentials. Uh, so that's the Library of American Comics. Um, I know it's too bright. I don't know why uh, that happened. I could have sworn I tested this. I kind of want to get up and do something with the lights, but um, let me see. Maybe that, this part of it is okay. What is going on here? Let me try something. May I ask a favor? Can you see if you hit one of those lights? No. Let's see. Yeah, turn that one off as well. Hmm. Let's see in this utter darkness if I can. There we go. I think. How does that look? Does that look better? So this is from, Baron and Bean is from 1916. So this, uh, the crazy cat is from 1934. And I think this will give you a better sense of its, um, hold on. A better sense of its production uh, because it's being replicated in that newspaper style with the date of the strip preserved on top. And uh, Sunday Press, yes, I love Sunday Press. They're hard to get in India. I think uh, the runs are limited, and of course, the size of the books uh, make them, you know, transporting them a bit. I mean, I mean, they get damaged very easily. In fact, the first order that I had of these books uh, from from Amazon they arrived damaged. I don't know if they got damaged in shipping or if they were already damaged, uh, but I had to return them. These are the replacement copies that luckily are not uh, damaged, but they very easily could have been. I think it's because the the binding, it's, it's, it's great when it's sitting on your shelves, right? And it's great when you're reading it, but when you're shipping something that is this long, it can it can put a lot of slippage, like the covers, if you think about it, the covers can slip and the pages are only, I'll need to cover my face. Yeah, so the pages are only attached in this thin an area. So as handsome as these productions are and as easy as they are to read because they lie absolutely flat and it's sewn binding, so it's not glued. So you don't have to worry about anything like that. It does feel archival and essential. The shipping of these books, I think, needs to be handled uh, with extreme care. You've got to, you, if, if, especially the way that Amazon sometimes ship things, where you just throw it into a polythene bag and, you know, mail it. Uh, that's not going to work uh, for these books. They need to be in boxes. They need to be tightly wrapped so that the covers don't shift and uh, slide against each other. That's the only thing that I would warn against. If you are going to buy these books, I would pick them up in a bookstore if you can, if you've got that uh, possibility. Otherwise, buy them from in India. I think we have um, Bookswagon. So Bookswagon does proper shipping, like good quality shipping. And that's, you know, that's where I would get these from. So 
I've I've seen that there are at least four others, of course, that I'm interested in, and uh, I'm 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 thinking that Amazon, even though I got lucky with these replacement copies, Amazon may not be at least in. India, uh, it's not the place uh, for me to get these. I'm going to go to Bookswagon. I'm going to go to places that I know bind them uh, better for uh, for shipping. I'm going to see if I can do one more thing before I move on. I'm just going to check the comic, the comments as well. Sorry. Uh... Yes, great artwork. I mean, George Herriman is just uh, is just fantastic. If you're not aware of George Herriman, I mean, I wasn't until uh, much, much later in life reading comics, but he's, uh, he's, he's groundbreaking and pathbreaking and all of that stuff. But it's not as if, um, you know, there are some people where you appreciate them because of what they were in history. But when you read them today, you don't, you're like, ah, it's okay, I've seen better, and it's not that great. And so it's only historical, your appreciation of them. Herriman is, is not like that. He feels extremely contemporary, his, his artwork, his stylings, uh, and especially with um, uh, Crazy Cat, uh, the, the same formula playing over and over and over again and not getting tired. In fact, becoming almost, I don't know what it would be, you know, like some sort of a postmodern commentary. It's, there's a there's a triangle of sorts and uh, the, the stuff with gender and the stuff with gags and how comedy is developed and how it comes across in panels. It just feels extremely modern. So there are many more eloquent people and famous, um, you know, uh, cartoonists and comics uh, so, so here's some stuff, uh, Polly and her pals from 1933, uh, Sidney Smith's The Gumps from 1929. These are some of the other things uh, that are available in this LOAC Essential series. So these are... Um, You've got you you've got a little write up at the back about this series. You've got write ups at the beginning. Uh, you know, as I said, uh, giving context. Uh, so these are the kind of things that I don't think you need to buy every single copy there is. <laughs> you know, anything that you buy, any one that you get, will give you a nice little rounded context for it, which I think is a superb way to learn a little bit more, like I do. You know, about about these comics and about these strips um, that that otherwise would just be lost. I mean, we would have no idea about these things. So I really appreciate publishers uh, bringing these out. You know, this is IDW. It's fantastic that IDW is in the business of preserving classics. I know that they do this thing with European comics as well, where they publish European comics. And I really appreciate the fact that they do that. It used to be only drawn in quarterly or, um, uh, you know, Fantagraphics uh, who would do that for, say, the North American presses where which are the things that we can get in India, uh, but this stuff is uh, is is terrific. Um, all newspaper comic compendium in one. That would be just way too big. I mean, you've got to be able to break it down. So I've seen things, I've seen collections where they do it as, you know, an anthology. So you get a sampling. Uh, Sunday Press does things that are, you know, by artist or by strip. Uh, Sunday Press also has books that are by, um, uh, they're, they're not comprehensive. So Fantagraphics has Crazy Cat, uh, where they go year by year and they give you every single strip. Uh, Fantagraphics obviously also has uh, the Peanuts collection, which is a fantastic uh, you know, uh, archival attempt, especially with Peanuts. What happens, I think, is Peanuts is one of those things like Calvin and Hobbes that um, that gets sampled a lot. So you get a lot of things where you only get one strip or you get the thing that would be um, the kind of thing that you put in your office cubicle, you know, thing that's a quotable quote, but more than Calvin and Hobbes, because Calvin and Hobbes was just 10 years. Peanuts ran for 55 years. There's a lot of stuff which is not filler. It's just atmosphere. So the fact that you can put together the complete peanuts means that you're not taking just the crowd pleasing stuff, you know, the stuff with peen, um, uh, with uh, the Red Baron, you know, or Snoopy. It's not just those things. It's all of the quieter ones. It's all of the sadder ones, all next to each other, uh, very democratically presented. So that's one of the things that I like about 
the complete collections instead of the anthologies, instead of the samplers, because the samplers tend to say, this is what's going to be the most crowd pleasing. This is going to be the punchline. This is going to be the quotable quote. This is the stuff you can put on a a bumper sticker or a t-shirt, you know, and that's, and that's fine. And that's great. And that's fantastic to hook new readers. But if you want to get the essence of what someone achieved, um, those are the kind of collections, uh, the, the, the larger ones, even if it's just one year, you know, just get the whole year, uh, see what they had. And even if there are hits and misses, that kind of, I don't know, the, the ups and downs of it are, are uh, extremely interesting. Uh, but I mean, I like anthologies because they tell you what you might want to seek out in you know, more pure and detailed form. Having said that, Sunday Press does have selections so like the little nemo and i've got a video on um, little nemo out there tashin has now put out these two volumes in which they get um i think it's almost except for the very tail end it's the complete little nemo in these two volumes but sunday press has these huge books that are very expensive now um and i think hard to get although i did get both of them in india at less than list price i mean those were miraculous days but their selections. So they they picked the best ones or they picked the ones that they could uh, find to reproduce or put into, um, uh, you know, rescan or recolor or repair. And, and there's some very interesting stories of how they repaired it. It's like when the letters are missing from a word balloon, they got the letter E from another word balloon somewhere else and put the E in there so that it's the same writing it's the same lettering uh, just from a different source but within the same comic strip it's that kind of restoration that's taken place on those things I know there are some people who feel the colors but I mean at least speaking for myself I know so little about these strips and I know um, you know I've got such little experience with them that for me anything Uh, like this is a revelation. I mean, I'm not a scholar, so I can't really nitpick about how much better it could have been or how different it could have been, whether it's a sampling or whether it's a complete collection, whether the colors are a little, uh, you know, I'll get to that later if I ever become a scholar. For me right now, I'm just going from like knowing nothing to being astonished by what has existed, you know, for over a hundred years, which is what I really, really like about these Let's take a look at the chat. Q&A in live discussion. It's not a bad idea. I mean, like this one, I wanted to have something because first of all, I didn't know if anyone was going to turn up, but so happy to see people here. And I also wanted to have some sort of a shape or some sort of a form. So for my first live stream, but I do have a Q&A call out there. There's a video out there in which I've asked for people's questions and uh, there are a lot of questions. So I might have to break it up into multiple videos. Those of you who've been following this channel for a while will not be surprised by that decision. My, you know, it's always like, why make one video when you could make five? Uh, so I may have multiple Q&A videos. I'll obviously intersperse them amongst my other spotlight videos and stuff like that. And maybe one of those Q&A videos uh, could, be, could be a live Q&A video for sure. Uh, if you have any questions about these comics or if you want to see something or have, you know, want to talk about these things over here, we can definitely... We can definitely, yes, the Archie Americana box set, getting there. So we've got 1916, and because it's George Herriman, 1934, Library of um, American Comics Essentials Essentials Volumes. Those are the ones that we've got over here. Um, Next up, I thought we could take a look at uh, Walt Disney's Mickey Mouse uh, from Fantagraphics by Floyd Godfredson. This is the second volume of a complete Mickey Mouse newspaper strips collection being brought out by Fantagraphics. So this is 1932 to 1934 dailies. So these are the daily comic strips. And now you'll see... um, How? So say the first story is the Great Orphanage Robbery.
and over here you've got three strips, three of the daily strips. And uh, yes, the Gottfriedson stories were major, were a major influence on Karl Barx. Karl Barx is obviously famous for, um, sorry, are we going to try to do something with the lights? Yes. Um, All right, let's see if we can do something on the fly. Tilting it forward to see if that helps. All right, let's try turning one of these lights off and one of these lights. It's a good thing I have my wife helping me over here in checking this out. What's the first thing? Live streamer. How about if we turn another one of these off? Ugh. See, these are the things that you don't need to... Whoa, okay. All right, is that is that better? It's kind of like a horror movie in here now. I know. <laughs> Support structure. Um, I think that's a little bit better. And let's see if I can get the focus. There we go. So again, Gottfriedson is someone I'd heard of. I've never actually read any of Gottfriedson's old Mickey Mouse comics. Now, honestly, that's also because Mickey Mouse to me is kind of plain vanilla. And the funny thing is that a lot of the writing in this, which is the preface material, um, you know, the the afterwards, the notes, uh, they openly accept that. They're like, especially from the 1950s and definitely, well, I, I would say definitely today, although I've noticed that there's a new Mickey Mouse uh, cartoon out Um which, which I only recently learned about, which I think is actually pretty good. But Mickey Mouse did become kind of bland, and especially because Mickey Mouse became brand ambassador for Disney. Um, you know, you couldn't do anything with Mickey Mouse because he was brand ambassador. So no matter what other, uh, you know, so Carl so Barks was able to do a lot of cool stuff with Uncle Scrooge because Uncle Scrooge could be, you know, he could be a comedic foil. He could be involved in pratfalls. He could be uh, miserly. You could make fun of him. And, and that, that made for interesting stories. But in the 1930s, Godfredson wrote long form adventures of Mickey Mouse in which Mickey Mouse was a swashbuckling adventurer. And these stories are, uh, you know, the birth of like the Disney serialized stories. And the reason why I got volume two, uh, not volume one, uh, one, because I wanted to try them out and see if it was actually interesting. Because again, so with classic comics, I'm always in two minds. One, I want to know more about the history. I want to know about the details. And I want to know how things were and where they got started. And I want to see if, uh, you know, the art, I can, I can learn about influences and things like that. At the same time, I'm always worried that it'll be dated and it'll be uninteresting or it will be, but it could be a man, many things. It could be melodramatic. It could be offensive to today's tastes. So I'm always into wine. So I always want to try things out. And then if I like them, I want to continue. Otherwise, I'm like, okay, that's good enough. I got an idea. I don't have to be comprehensive. I'm not that kind of a collector, but I have to have every single volume of every single thing uh, that I buy. Uh, if I absolutely fall in love with it, then yes, sometimes that can happen. Uh, but one, the artwork is terrific. It's very action oriented. The comedy in it is high energy. Uh, there are very interesting notes in here. Uh, one of the examples I can give you is um, one of the examples I can give you is the thing with sweat uh, or the sweat drops. The idea is that they're not actually sweat drops, so that they don't have to always represent physical exertion. Uh, you know, it's just excitement. It's it and 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 it's something that. I mean, we know, we understand that. Even uh, even when we see it, we don't necessarily think that someone's exerting themselves necessarily. It's just one of those things in comics vocabulary that is so unique is that 
I don't think any of us were ever told that what do these drops coming out of Mickey mean? It just it can mean he's scared. It can mean he's um, excited. It can mean that he's uh, um, you know in danger or something like that. And that's the kind of stuff with these classic comics that really appeal to me is when you find the the sort of genesis of these things is like oh look 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 at that look 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 at how i know that pluto is happy how did i know this nobody taught me this it's not so it's it's somewhere between reading and and art which is obviously what comics is like i have to learn to read i have to learn letters and the alphabet and things like that pictures i don't really have to i mean i can say a tree is a tree and i can kind of understand it so the vocabulary of a language excitement emotion coming through in pictures and how it was birthed over here is one of the interesting things the other interesting thing is the first volume has the earliest Gottfriedson stories um, with Mickey Mouse, which were very gag oriented. So they were very jokey, you know, I'm like, here's a joke, he falls down, it's a pratfall, and he was just finding his voice. It's from the second volume and these stories onwards that they became longer adventures. And when, uh, you know, as, as, uh, as, as one of you pointed out, uh, the influence on Karl Box. Karl Box is known for his longer form adventures. Of course, he had his duck stories that had... Uh, gags uh, you know there were one pagers and things like that but what we really recall uh, is the kind of stuff that gave birth to ducktales right so and and inspired don rosa so those kind of long form stories are actually born from uh, trapped on treasure island and uh, the great orphanage robbery and the stories that are collected in this second volume so this is a nice turning point for Godfredson that I thought I wanted to. And there are some very interesting things in it, uh, <laughs> like Mickey in blackface uh, performing um, Uncle Tom's Cabin. It's it's unusual. And uh, I mean, I suppose there are ways of looking at those things as being offensive, but he is putting on a play which at that time was an extremely popular play. And uh, th there's an interesting uh, foreword over here which describes how that play was changed uh, to be pro-South or at least, you know, not show the South of the United States in a bad light. And then there was a more uh, pro-North or a more uh, faithful version to the novel. And so how these plays and how they were put across, you know, is the slaver uh, uh, just a bad apple and everyone else is actually not that bad or is he representative? I mean, these things were choices that were made in the putting on of plays. So in some ways, Mickey putting on this play itself is kind of a radical thing that you don't think uh, that you would see today or you wouldn't see definitely in the 50s or the 60s in which Mickey Mouse decides to raise funds for an orphanage by putting on uh, Uncle Tom's cabin. Now, unfortunately, even, it, even at that time, um, when that play was performed, it was often performed by white actors in blackface. And that was just the way it was performed because you didn't have black actors playing black roles. So even if it is, uh, you know, even if it is an anti-slavery story, there are those kind of weird things in it. So apart from the birth of this kind of storytelling and apart from this Mickey Mouse uh, character being a very different Mickey Mouse than what we know, there are also those kind of historical uh, things preserved in these stories, which I think are extremely important uh, to preserve, which is why I really appreciate these kind of handsome collections uh, which give the thing a proper respect it's not out there being packaged to say to kids today you know uh, seven or eight year olds here read this it's here some funny stuff it's 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 for grown-ups to understand uh, history and to understand how the art form developed and how the storytelling in it had complexities uh, within it which is which is i think uh, very very uh, interesting um Let's take a look at some questions. Calvin and Hobbes, yes, absolutely. I mean, I think, uh, and, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, but the one of the reasons, uh, because I grew up reading things like Calvin and Hobbes and to a certain extent, Peanuts, which I don't think many people read Peanuts anymore. And a lot of these are more grown-up excavations. You know, I read Archie when I was young and of course, superhero comics and things like that. But even in the newspaper, Maybe some Beetle Bailey, maybe um, Hagar the Horrible, uh, Dennis the Menace, uh, not 
maybe the original Hank Ketchum stuff, but later stuff. And a lot of it was just rinse and repeat. It just seemed like the same thing over and over again. It wasn't until many years later that I realized that a long time ago, newspaper comic strips were very different. They were much more adventurous. They were much more dangerous. They were much more sly. There were a lot of different things happening. And then when you discover things like Crazy Cat, when you discover things like Gasoline Alley uh, by Frank King, uh, you realize that in the middle, <laughs> something happened uh, that they went away, which is why I think Calvin and Hobbes is such a unique thing. It's, it sort of harkens back to a more classic uh, newspaper comic strip storytelling style. And uh, when you read some of these classic things, I think you find that... Uh, this is where it came from. This is what inspired Bill Watterson. This is what inspires things like Doonesbury or uh, um, Aaron McGruder, uh, you know, with the boondocks. I mean, there is a there is an edge to daily newspaper or Sunday, uh, you know, uh, comics uh, that that used to be there, that went away, that became more plain, that became more vanilla and... Uh, and that's why people have a certain judgment of newspaper comic strips, just the way that people have judgments about comic books. Or, uh, but comic strips also, I mean, I mean, most of you probably know this, but comic strips being collected into printed volumes are the origin of comic books. So the first comic books were not adventure stories or stories written to be books. They were reprints of things that had been published in the newspaper. And it was the success of that and uh, the growing uh, business, uh, you know, lucrative business of it that led to stories being written specifically for stapled comic books. So even in that way, newspaper comic strips are really the birthplace of comics and comic books and monthlies and graphic novels and things like that as, as, as we know them today. At least that's my uh, limited understanding of it so far. Yeah, this is, I mean, and I see there are some questions. Okay, so here's a revelation that every now and then I do need to put on reading glasses. And uh, what are we talking about? Strips and racism. Yes, and this is a very, very interesting uh, area. I mean, this is something that I think I could talk about for hours, about racism and what a racism means. And I think one of the interesting things, and I'm not going to get into it now because I do think uh, that's uh, kind of a separate topic for a separate thing, but I do think it's interesting that someone challenged a particular dictionary definition of racism uh, some months ago, saying that this idea of um, one person being racist to the other isn't all that is racism. I mean, racism is something that is systemic. Racism is something that is institutional. It is something you can have a racist structure without it being populated by a racist person in, in, in weird ways. But the idea, if we say that this is racist, I mean, it really, it needs context by what we mean by, what do we mean by it's racist? Like, racism is about meanness. It's about putting something down. It's about creating a system and the depiction of things as they were, or the depiction of things as uh, an accurate portrayal of the times. It's, 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 a, it's a difficult thing to judge because if you say the times were racist, it's kind of, um, it's kind of an oversimplification. I mean, yes, racism is an institutional thing. It is something that has come over many years and it has been propagated and it's been put into place and it's been cemented over there. But art, for example, sometimes has, um, uh, art has a role of reflecting society. It also can pass judgment on it, maybe. Uh, it can have a prescriptive attitude, maybe. I mean, some people would say any art that carries too much of a polemic, tries to teach too much or tries to lecture too much, stops being art because then it becomes like, I mean, would you call your textbook art? It, it doesn't mean it's not full of facts, uh, but is that what art is? Or is art a way of looking at the world? Is it a way of crystallizing uh, or synthesizing what's out there? So I do think it's interesting to me because when I read it, I feel uncomfortable. I feel uncomfortable at certain areas where I'm like, okay, that's definitely not getting made today. But I think if you find something like that being made today, that should really bother you because today is a very different time than 
you know, 80, 90 years ago. 80, 90 years ago, again, if I'm reading something that propagates that system, that tells you that this is, you know, uh, white is superior to black, if uh, they are uh, telling you that these minorities deserve to be in this, or this is the way that, um, you know, God has always wanted it, those kind of things, I think, I could classify as racist because they are propagating, they are um, teaching, they are glamorizing that way of thinking. The things that reflect a way of thinking, um, and this is this is why it's a difficult situation. You know, it's like which one is it? Isn't it glamorizing it? Like, is Mickey in blackface automatically racist? Is it? I mean, it's an interesting question because if he's putting on a play and the play is Uncle Tom's Cabin, and there is an interesting essay over here, is that Uncle Tom's Cabin today has a very different reputation. It was an anti-slavery um, thing. I mean, Lincoln said that uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin uh, created the Civil War, or the Civil War existed in part because of that book, because it woke people up to injustices and how wrong things were and things like that. And even the character of Uncle Tom has become a catchphrase in a very different way today. But Mickey Mouse putting on Uncle Tom's cabin is putting on a successful play at the time. It's going to create, um, you know, it's going to bring in a lot of tickets. It's going to sell a lot of tickets. It's going to help save the orphanage. So he's going for a best-selling play. It's an anti-slavery play. It's, you know, it's an abolitionist play. And uh, that shows you where Mickey's politics lie. And uh, this was performed, I mean, it was performed by white actors because there weren't black actors, at least from my understanding of it, there weren't black actors. That's not the way society worked at that time. So that is an unfortunate thing. And that's a, you know, a thing that we would never do today and we would never think of today. But if I look at the context, am I, you know, it does, does that mean that the story is racist? I don't, I don't, I don't think so. Anyway, that's a very interesting question. It's a very interesting topic. And I think that uh, it was in my Q&A questions as well. People have asked me about Hergé and what I think about Tintin. And uh, I've had a request for, I think, the last couple of years that I've been thinking about where someone says, why don't you make a video, uh, is Tintin racist? And I think that's a fantastic idea. I just don't know how to how to make that because is Tintin racist? Is like, is the series racist? Was the author racist? Is the character of Tintin racist? Is what he is in the first adventure the same thing that he is in the 24th adventure? Um, it's uh, it's it's definitely it's definitely something that I think we should all uh, talk about. But again, getting back to Mickey Mouse, I, I think it should be preserved. I don't think we should pretend uh, that these things didn't exist. Uh, I, that's why I say that it's not being put forward as a children's cartoon for children to watch today, to say, here's entertainment. It's being put together as a scholarly volume with notes. It's being put together with, um, with, with uh, people writing around it as well and providing context. And it's for uh, us to read, you know, adults, mature adults who understand these contexts and try to understand what has happened. Because if you ignore things, if you pretend things never existed or uh, that wasn't part of the fabric that also created great art and also created great stories, uh, then you can say that it doesn't exist today. And I think that's one of those things that we need to think about is why do so many people, you know, it's over. There's no such thing as racism anymore. It's because they've, they, and you're not, you're not getting enough context. But Anyway, I think I think the second volume, at least, is very worth checking out um, for all of uh, for all of these reasons. Is Mickey Mouse white? <laughs> I think it's a good question. I, I mean, the the if if you read the story, you'll know that uh, because he has to take the white part. It reminds me of the thing in Blackstead where, uh, <laughs> where, where, where you know, all all the animals who are black say, "Oh, you got some white on you," you know, because thing is part white and part black uh, it's a good question um but yeah so that's that's mickey mouse next uh all right i'll ask you guys what should we what should we talk about next we can talk about pogo we can talk about archie or we could talk about carl barks uh ducks All right, let's let's uh, let's talk about Archie. Archie is, and we'll get to. We're, we're going to do all of them, so you know. There's, I'm just uh, Archie is very funny because 
when I was growing up, I read a lot of RG. I mean, um, I may have read Tintin the most number of times, but there were only a certain number of volumes. And uh, I read uh, whatever Marvel DC stuff I could find. Uh, at that time in India, you had reprints of Harvey comics. So you had Richie Rich and Casper and Archie for some reason, it, it was just endless. There, there was a lot of Archie. I mean, there, there was a lot of Archie in the bookstores. There was a lot of Archie on the footpaths and um, uh, booksellers everywhere had it. All your friends had Archie. And um, it wasn't in the single issues. It was all in digests or double digests. And it was just endless. So I read probably, I mean, there are comics I read more often over and over again, but as far as a single character, I probably read more Archie growing up than any other character, any other character, just because of the volume of Archie there was. And when I got older and I would talk to people about Archie, they were just like, I, especially not Indians, um, you know, so I think maybe maybe most Indians or many Indians or at least Indians my age might have a familiarity uh, with Archie. But especially if I talk to, say, someone from the United States and uh, they were like, really, who reads Archie? I was like, I've never heard of anyone who's ever read Archie comics. And I'm like, I've read is like, well, I know of Archie and I know like Betty and Veronica and the two of them. And but I've never actually read Archie actively. And I was like, no, I, I know. I know Moose's last name. I know Midge's last name. I know, you know, whether Principal Weatherby's first name and all of these kind of things. It's like I am very familiar with Archie, but Archie then had a reputation of not being very cool, not being very good comics. And funnily, that's changed over the last couple of years or uh, the last decade or so where Archie's sort of had a resurgence um, in new stories, uh, in crossovers, as well as an appreciation for some of the more classic uh, uh, Archie stuff. So I I wanted to see, and, and, and there are some of my childhood comics, like my Tintins and like my um, Amar Chitra Kathas and all of those that, that I still have from my childhood. I have none of my Archies. I don't, you know, it's just one of those things. It's like they... Uh, they got borrowed and never returned or exchanged or thrown away. I mean, they fell apart. Uh, I have no Archies from my childhood, so I have no nostalgic copy of Archie. Some years ago, I decided to try Archie and see, and I found this book on um, Amazon for quite cheap. It was very cheap, uh, Archie Comics, 75 years. And this, you know, it's like one of those, uh, uh, one of the commenters was saying, this is an anthology. This collects Archie from all across, uh, across uh, 75 years. So it's from, from actually from 19, what was it? From 1930, from 1941. So from 1941 uh, to 2015, uh, there are Archie stories collected here. So Archie started a long time ago. And what I really liked about this is that it gave you a sampling through the years. It gave you artists and writers' names. And that is one thing that I don't remember well, I remember some, Dandy Carlo, obviously, but it's kind of like those Disney comics where <laughs> I don't remember credits from Archie comics. Um, maybe that's just my memory, but I mean, there definitely were credits in Marvel and DC comics. So, you know, I at least I, I would I would get to see certain names, uh, particularly editors' names. So even if you had a different writer and artist, you would you would see the same editorial stuff show up over and over again. Um, that's how you learn about Stan Lee. And so, in Archie comics, I never got credits, so I had a lot of images of Archie in my head, but I didn't know who they were other than Dandy Carlo. Now, Dandy Carlo, obviously, when I looked through this anthology, I was like, oh, that's the guy. I got to get this stuff. So I got this. This is from IDW, and this is uh, the best of Dandy Carlo, and this is volume one. There are many other volumes, I think three or four at least. I was only able to get this one. The other artist um, from Archie, I really like was uh, Harry Lucy and Harry Lucy's best of also from IDW I wasn't able to get my hands on I mean I'm still looking for it it's it's available but like with import taxes and all that stuff it's really expensive but I know thanks to this volume that Harry Lucy is 
is is another person I need to get. And um, Lil Archie, it was like miniature, you know, it's like Muppet Babies. So it's like Lil Archie was 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 terrific. So those are the books that I've decided that I wanted to get. But these books, this uh, this is this is a this is a fantastic book. It's it's very well produced. IDW again, you know, really knocking it out of the park as far as production and uh, reproduction is concerned. Um, the colors, very bright, very sharp, uh, very nice pages. And uh, Dandy Carlo is an absolute classic guy. Now, both Harry Lucy and Dandy Carlo are very, very influential on a lot of people, especially um, the Hernandez brothers. So Jaime and Gilbert Hernandez have a lot of stuff that you can see comes from these. Of course, they put it into a much more adult context with their love and rocket stories. But I, I'm not ashamed of liking these stories. I mean, they're, they're, there's some stuff that's not that great. And the gags aren't always great. But the energy and the expressionism, you know, the, the expressions, uh, the way uh, these guys react, the way they interact, uh, the way from panel to panel you have, uh, you know, uh, 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 someone saying something, someone reacting to something, someone reacting to that reaction. This is comics vocabulary for me, again, very formative, which is why I was really happy to find this box set uh, called Archie's Americana, also published by IDW, a collection of hardcover uh, volumes put into a box set. Now, I think this also exists in paperback form. I'm not sure. I found this in hardcover, and I found this for a gloriously low price, at least given how uh, primed I was. Because this book, as as great as it is, is very cheaply produced. You know, so you, I, I don't know if you can see, but the pages warp. Uh, you know, it's it's hard to open it, and then when you do open it, the pages will tear. The reproduction in many ways is very nostalgia friendly because this is exactly how, you know, the rough paper and uh, how, how, how the Archie comics of my childhood used to feel, but it's, it's tough to read and you get the, you get a good example of it. But once you, once you know, you like some of the stuff, um, I think this, this was kind of a no brainer. I was like, wow, look at this. And this is 1940s, 1950s, 1960s and 1970s. And uh, hardcover volumes from starting from the very beginning. Now, I know that these volumes are also available as standalone purchasable. And so if you don't get the box set, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it's a box set and fine. It's great and all that stuff. But these volumes, I mean, they are handsomely made. They don't have those binding problems. They don't have the manufacturing problems. The paper is good quality. Uh, it's got some, you know, writing introductions. It starts from the first one. And in fact, I like a little bit more this color reproduction. It's a little more muted than that best of Dandy Carlo. I mean, this is something that we can always take a closer look at. And maybe I'll put some comparative uh, photographs up on the, the YouTube community page or uh, the Facebook page. But this, this, is, this being a little bit more muted, for example, these yellows, I mean, they're not as bright and as garish and because Archie comics are so much in primary colors, uh, especially these early issues, but you know, there's not a lot of detail in the background. It's just green. I think it being muted uh, really makes a difference. So this, the 1940s is a great place to have the first Archie stories, although they're not, they're not the best, but again, they're a snapshot and they're a snapshot, not of, I mean, I wouldn't say that's what American teen life was, but you know, it's, uh, I mean, who knows? There is, um, uh, w when I was a kid reading Archie comics, I thought American kids were the luckiest kids in the whole world. You know, they drove cars and their parents were never around and they had jobs and they earned money. And uh, it, it was fantastic. And that was helped by the ads uh, in, in those comics where the, the, the entire American life uh, and, and that's kind of matched later when you watch um, Steven Spielberg movies. And, you know, just like, yeah, everyone's just riding bicycles and all over the place and nobody ever says anything to them. And they've all got very nice 
toys. <laughs> so, and 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 uh, Archie's Americana is uh, very suitable from that point of view. It's it's like I don't know if it's an accurate representation of teen life in those times. I'm pretty sure it isn't. It's it's very whitewashed in many ways. It's very simplified and gag oriented. But I don't know if people outside of the United States know how much of an ambassador Archie and uh, the gang have been for the American way of life. Uh, you know, whether it's uh, malts at the chocolate shop or uh, drive-in movie theaters. And I mean, even if you say that that American no longer, it's, it's kind of like, like reading Archie 1950s is basically like watching American graffiti. You know, it's, it's, it's that kind of thing. It's like someone's got a jalopy, someone's got a cool car, and uh, it's about going out and parking somewhere. And it's all of these myths um, that, that, that I find uh, to be sort of Archie's forte, which is why this box set, uh, you know, labeled Archie's Americana, is, uh, is right up my alley. I'm, again, I'm not, I'm not, of the impression that these are superb comics, although I do think they're very good comics. And I do think that people like Dan DiCarlo and Harry Lucy have got a lot to do with how I appreciate comics and how I appreciate uh, conversation, how I appreciate gags, how I appreciate things moving from one place to another. And long, long before I watched American sitcoms or American TV, which you know wasn't, wasn't a common thing in my childhood at all, that idea of where the story ends, you know, it's like whether it's a freeze frame or a wah, wah, or all of those kind of things, they came much, much later. Archie knew how to end a story in two or three, four or five different ways that, that, that again, for me, is very formative comics vocabulary. So this box set is uh, fantastic. I know that there are, this. So, so this is 1940s, 1950s, 60s and 70s and that's you know that's that's the sweet spot for me up to the 70s 80s mm, i've read a lot of archies and i've i've, I've got obviously uh, a, a good sampling over here and i think 80s will be good but i don't know if i'm going to read beyond the 80s i do um i did really like afterlife with archie which was that horror but i read the first volume and i'm still waiting for the second volume to come out so and i read the mark wade and fiona staples new relaunch of archie and it was good but i don't know i i, I didn't get into it as much as i thought i would especially with those with those two at the i've heard a lot of good stuff about the crossovers and so recently i read Archie versus Predator, which is apparently the one that started it all, and it was it was it was quite surprising. I mean, I don't know if I'm gaga over it, but I thought it was uh, surprising. I, it was more violent than I thought it was going to be. It was uh, the the art style of it uh, was so contrasted against uh, the rest of it. So so those kind of modern takes on Archie and the kind of playing with the Archie formula. I think those are doing a fantastic uh, job. And of course, um, I read Criminal, the, the, what is this, the Last of the Innocent, uh, which, which is obviously a take on Archie, and it was fantastic. But of course, that's not Archie. This is the classic Archie, I think, is this 40s to 70s. Not everything in the 40s is great. Not everything in the 50s is great, but it's, but it's there. And uh, for anyone who grew up reading Archie, it's a fantastic nostalgia box set, but I think you can really look upon it as that Americana, American dream sort of um, collected in a box. I don't know if they're going to put the others in a box from 80s, 90s, 2000, 2010. Well, okay, so at the end of the 2010s, they might have, they might have four volumes, but I don't know if it would have the same impact as 40s to 70s as a, as a capsule, uh, the way that this, that this box set does. The Last of the Innocents, thank you. Yes, of course. Uh, the Seduction of the Innocent. I was like, no, that's something, that's something else altogether. Um, let's take a look at some questions. Bookstore sells old issues for $1? Yeah, I mean, so because there are people on the chat from all over the place, I think people in India or people similar to India where we don't have that kind of access are always going to be really jealous. So I know that 
you know, in most uh, comic book conversations, anytime people mention in stock trades or cheap graphic novels.com or something like that, or even my comic shop.com, which is, you know, a great resource, people get, oh, you know, oh, I wish I had those kind of things. Uh, it's, it's just not, it's just not the same over here. When I was growing up, there was a lot more export import and i think a lot of old copies and a lot of unsold stock would find its way over here and uh, you know you, you just kind of stumble upon things uh, there are people who i still know who, who will tell you stories of just finding things at uh, um, you know the the vegetable market and people are just using old comics to wrap up vegetables and they're like hold on hold on i'll take that whole stack you know you don't you wrap with newspaper if you want and stuff like that but I, it's just not the case these days and uh, with import duties and taxes and freight costs going all over the place uh, india the comics i mean i'm not complaining because it sounds when i talk to many of you online it sounds like it's still better than some places where there's absolutely no uh, comics from europe or america or japan getting in there or they're extremely expensive and things like that so india i think so, somewhere in the middle it's not as bad as some places but it's not as great as it is i mean if we had comic book stores with used comics and things like that i know most of the people on this chat who are from India would be spending most of their waking hours in, in, in a place like that. Yeah, a dollar an issue is a good price. Um, you know, I, I, I think on eBay, sometimes you can find things that are even cheaper where it's like, 12 issues for $10 or something like that. But there's just no way, like even if I purchased something, uh, when am I going to get it shipped to me? That shipping cost is going to be huge and then customs is going to stop it. Or I can have it shipped, as, as some of you know that I do, I have it shipped to my sister. But then it's just like her house is filling up with <laughs> comics for me. And uh, there's just, there, there are limits, although, although we pretend... Um, Although we pretend that there aren't any such limits, but used bookstores, I think that's just one of those things. I mean, like bookstores in general are are becoming a thing of the past in so many ways. Uh, this is another topic for another conversation that could just go on for hours because I've always tried to crack this problem of you know what's, but but you can't you can't have a bookstore. I mean, it's like not when you could have a store that sells mobile phones or, you know, cosmetics or something like that. I mean, rent versus how much money you make versus all it, the numbers just don't make sense. So the only place you could have a bookstore is in the middle of nowhere where no one else wants that real estate. And it just, uh, the things don't, the things don't work out. Um, but, but it's a shame. I, you would have thought that the internet would make certain things better. And, and it has, I mean, I think, even even those of us over here on the chat complaining about uh, access and availability uh, without the internet, we would be miserable. So, I mean, at least we have the luxury of sitting over here and ordering things. Uh, they are expensive, but we make our choices, you know, and people um, have wish lists and they go through and you, you get to a position where you're like, okay, I need a job because I got to buy some comics. And uh, every month you put something away and you buy these things. And at least you're able to order some things. You're able to get your hands on some things. Like I got these, uh, I got this box set from Amazon India. So sometimes people talk about shipping and damage and this, that, and the other. And I don't know if I uh, showed you, hold on one second. Over here, there is a little bit of a dent, for example. in that corner and it's it's almost like i don't even care like i'm not going to be able to get this anywhere else i'm not going to be able to go into a bookstore and find it and usually even if i did go to a bookstore it will also be damaged in the bookstore i mean looking for something that is absolutely pristine etc anyway i have an issue with that so i don't i mean i don't want things to arrive ripped i don't want things to arrive like absolutely damaged and dented in certain ways but those of you who've seen my um i have this unboxing galactus and i had this giant this thing like it arrived pretty badly dented in one corner, but even there, the price that I got it for and the fact that I wasn't going to get that any other way. And, you know, so it was on sale and I guess that, okay, maybe it's damaged and that's why it was on sale. You just, you have trade-offs. So I think it is, it is a little, 
it's it's a tough situation in some ways. It's not as tough as some other people have that. But yes, it would be fantastic if we could find old issues for a dollar. Now you could pick out the stories you want. You could pick out the artists, uh, you know, the writers that you like. Uh, I'm not an omnibus reader. I don't have to have the complete collection of everything as. I say in a video about box sets and collected editions, um, but uh, but 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 lacking that, I think uh, I, this is the kind of system that I figured out is that read up on things, get people to suggest and recommend things for you, uh, find an anthology or find some cheap books or find something that is used, find something that other people are getting rid of and uh, dip your toes in that and then choose which one you want to go for, you know, which one you want to spend the big bucks on. Don't try to buy everything. Don't try to get every single thing unless it is um, called box or Pogo, you know. I mean, these are uh, examples of where I go in the absolute opposite direction in which I've got to have every single thing. But that's because I've gotten to the point and I grew up reading a lot of Karl Barks in Indian reprint comics. And uh, I loved almost everything I read. I mean, it's it's sometimes difficult to separate nostalgia from uh, critical evaluation and things like that. But um, I don't. I don't have that problem with Karl Box. I I love reading his stories. I love reading his stories for nostalgia's sake, maybe, but also when I come back to them, which is why I really love um, these editions that are being brought out by Fantagraphics. So, so Fantagraphics has got this Mickey Mouse collection, you know, and they're going to be bringing out all of Gottfriedson's stories. I don't know if I'm going to sort of be a completionist about these. I know I really enjoyed uh, Volume Two. Uh, but for a lot of historical and contextual reasons as well. Uh, but I'm going to get all of the card box stories. I, I mean, like, uh, there are a couple of volumes that I'm unable to get my hands on right now, and I'm quite upset about that, but I will find a way to get them because this is one of those things which is a library of card box. And I've seen this, I've seen this, I think, in... Um, German editions and European editions. There have been there have been some complete Karl Marx collections out there, and then they went out of print, or they're very hard to get your hands on. The fact that uh, Fantagraphics is putting out um, two books or four books a year. I think they're putting out two books a year, the way they did with Peanuts, to complete uh, to to have the complete collection, is is a fantastic effort. Um, and unlike many of those other books, these are not out of print or hard to get yet, uh, not most of them. So what what is hard to get are these box sets. So I don't have, and I'm not making it a point to go after every box set because they bring out one book at the beginning of the year, then they bring out another volume at the end of the year. So I think it's like February and November or something like that, uh, March, or um, uh, you, you can let me know if you want... Um, uh, if, if you know exactly when they do that, but they bring out two books in a year. And when the second book comes out, they bring out a box set, putting those two books uh, together. That box set is some sort of a limited set. So uh, for most of the books that have been published so far, and I think uh, I think 14 or 16 of them have been, maybe even more, because I know I'm missing some. Um, I, I don't have except for one box set. And there's a Christmas box set, but that's not really, that's a themed box set. And that was put together because there are two books that are about Christmas. It's not the two volumes that go next to each other chronologically, uh, like volume 15 and 16 or things like that. And they're publishing them out of order. So they're not publishing them chronologically. They've got some sort of a system. <laughs> I, I, I find it hard to understand these things, but I was able to get my hands on these two box sets. So this one is... The Pixelated Parrot and Terror of the Beagle Boys, Donald Duck. So these are Donald Duck stories. They, of course, they do star um, Scrooge McDuck, but they're not. They're, they're they're published. They're from the Donald Duck comics. Uh, Carl Barks had Donald Duck comics and Uncle Scrooge comics, and Terror of the Beagle Boys and the Pixelated Parrot. In these wonderful hardcovers, um, you've probably seen. Um, these collections, but if you haven't, I can't recommend them highly enough. They're handsome, they're easy to read, they're very well manufactured and produced. The colors in them are terrific. They, 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 they're open flat. 
and um, and their Karl Barks, who was a sort of seminal figure, um, and, and I'm sure that most of you know about Karl Barks, but he was known as the good duck artist because like those Archies that I was talking about earlier, uh, the Disney comics didn't have credits in them. So you didn't know who the writer or the artist uh, was in them. It was just, you know, they're all Walt Disney comics, they're all generic, but his style and his stories were so good that people were able to point that out. So if you had an issue in which there were two stories or if you had uh, you know a later issue and an earlier issue they were able to tell the difference and he was that's where he got his name of the good doc artist he was later he became famous many many years later because fans sought him out uh, in pre internet days in uh, you know from what i hear he was able to at least to at the end of his life he was a superstar and uh, his artwork sold for thousands and thousands of dollars and things like that which i'm very happy to hear about because his his storytelling and his approach is really dynamic again it's a question of the way that he plotted things uh, the way the beats moved from one place to another with characters so it wasn't just gags it was about who donald is and who uh, gladstone gander is in and, and and this kind of storytelling the um the humor being based in character and situation equally i think a lot of people got their influence um from 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 these stories now there are a lot of these books luckily which is great because there are so many uh, things to enjoy and so many things to buy and collect and uh, the donald duck stories are are terrific are wonderful but i think i think most people will agree with me that the real gems of uh, carl box's works are uncle scrooge stories unfortunately i don't have in these collections uh, uncle scrooge box set because these are the ones i was able to find but uncle scrooge as i said does appear in these um, but the secret of hondorica and uh, the ghost sheriff of last gasp have stories in them that very closely resemble those uncle scrooge stories which is not just about jokes or not just about humorous situations but longer sort of adventure stories the ones where they go all across the world and they're searching for treasure and there's you know supernatural stuff involved and things like that and those stories i think are the ones that are uh, greatly responsible for Karl Barks's reputation because he made it uh, all ages fun so again i think something about the mickey mouse that we were talking about is that sometimes it's a little difficult to look back and on you know so somewhere people may think of disney in a particular way or disney cartoons or comics in a particular way that they're licensed properties and they're bland uh, that's not always the case and that definitely was not the case at the time that certain artists and writers were doing that in fact when i think when carl box was doing uncle scrooge it was the best selling comic or it was one of the best selling comics i think uncle scrooge at one point of time was outselling superman so uh, they were extremely popular and they were sort of on the cutting edge of popular comics they weren't like also there or you know something that you're giving to the kids it was it was things that uh, that were being read and of course when Don Rosa came along as the successor uh, to Karl Barks is because he captured a lot of that zing. He captured not just the stories and the plots and the characters that uh, Karl Barks had originated, uh, and the duck stories with Huey, Dewey, and Louie and Uncle Scrooge, and which which I think is uh, which I think are fantastic stories. So the Donald Duck stories are also really really good. The art style, the storytelling, the narrative, all of these things are just uh, are just fantastic. And if you can get your hands on the box um, on the boxes, you know the two volume box sets, that's great. But I would just say if you haven't ever read any Karl Box just pick up any one of these volumes pick up whichever one is cheapest uh, you won't be disappointed there'll be some that will be really good uh, but even the least of them will be completely enjoyable and I don't think they uh, as I say you know some of these older comics they may feel dated and you may want to read them only contextually um I don't think that's the case with Karl Marx that's definitely not the case with Don Rosa uh, who feels extremely you know he's much more modern but uh, Don Rosa and Karl Marx both I think do fantastic stuff with uh, Donald Duck with uh, Scrooge McDuck with the nephews um life in times of uncle scrooge yes that's uh, 
that's the Don Rosa 12 issues uh, that's collected in the Don Rosa. So if you, like Fantagraphics also has the complete Don Rosa library, just like that, that's that's done. So there are 10 volumes in the Don Rosa library and all 10 volumes are published and you can get all 10 volumes. I think they're still all in print. So that's something you can easily snap up. These are things, uh, these are still a work in progress. And I think you'll have, uh, you'll have maybe, I don't know how many we've got. I know with... I know with Mickey Mouse, it's going to run till 1975. So this is 1932 to 1934. The first book was 1931 to 32. So you can just imagine this is uh, 20 volumes, you know, something like that. There's going to be 20 volumes in this complete collection. Uh, this is probably Donald Duck and Uncle Scrooge put together will probably be something like 36 volumes total. Uh, you know, Peanuts was something like, how much was Peanuts? Like 26 or 30 volumes? I mean, it was like 55 years of Charles Schultz's Peanuts. So some of these uh, full set collections are, like you collect them <laughs> for years. You know, you pick them up two at a time. And that's, you know, that's that's the way it goes because you're, you're not going to pick up 36 hardcover set uh, in, in in one go. So it's, it's good in that they bring it out two books at a time, one box set a year, you know, or one Donald Duck box set, one Uncle Scrooge box set, however they've published it. And you just you just collect it if that's, if that's your thing. But if you're not into collecting the whole series for either Uncle Scrooge or Don Rosa, I would say just, you know, just, just go for any book that you find. The production is superb. The reproduction is superb. The, the, I, I'm, I like the binding and the colors and those things I think make a difference and they make a difference to when it's older stories because sometimes newer reprints can really misrepresent how things looked and how things felt and and completely change it and that's why I think publishers like Fantagraphics, publishers like IDW when they when they create such faithful and such wonderfully uh, you know with, with so much attention paid to it um, I think it makes a very big difference and that's why I also think uh, I can never truly get into reading digitally uh, fully because a, a big part of that is missing for me uh, in particular. I mean, it's always about the two-page format and because these comics were read, you know, designed to be read in a two-page format, but the, but the way that these books feel in your hand, you know, not just how they look on the shelf, but how it feels to pull them down from the shelf and read them is, um, is just terrific. So any volumes you can find of these uh, duck stories, I would, I would definitely recommend. Let's, let's take a look at the comments. Any questions? Where am I? Oh, that's a lot of comments. Archie and Happy Days glorified teenage life. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I couldn't wait to be a teenager, but then I wasn't in the United States. So, you know, what difference uh, does it uh, make? Um, what was the cost of the box set? Yeah, this is one of the things. I mean, people do keep asking me about costs, but I, um, I don't remember uh, most of the time. Or sometimes I'm averse to confessing how much I've spent on things, in, you know, especially when I put it on the record. But I usually, I usually, um, I don't, I don't like to overspend on something, uh, by which I mean, I have a fair enough idea of what the US list price is. And I have a fair enough idea of what kind of discounts are available on Amazon US for US buyers. So that's kind of like my base price. So whenever I look at something in India, I am I feel allergic to paying more than what someone in the United States is paying for uh, something they're buying off Amazon. Having said that, there are a lot of things that I think are extremely uh, valuable and I must have. So therefore, so I don't think over here, anything is above US list price, whatever the US list price is. I think in most cases, they are below US list price with a 10% to a 15% discount on US list price. Uh, by list price, I mean the, the sticker, the, the, the MMRP uh, for, you know, Indian, uh, it's like, it's like the stuff that would be before it's cut off, uh, you know, anything that's printed on the back, if they have the prices printed, this Mickey Mouse was very uh, cheap. This Mickey Mouse was less than $9, I think. Uh, so that was one of these things. These box sets were 
I, I, I really don't remember, but they want, I, I haven't overpaid for any of these things. This Archie's Americana box set was, was a bargain. That's what I remember. I think it was uh, maybe 30% of US list or it was exactly whatever it was after discount on Amazon US. So I was, I was happy picking it up. There are books that I've paid a lot more because I just know that I'm not going to get my hands on them. And, uh, but most of the time, most of the time I have a very good, and that's one of the things I spend so much time online looking at, at book prices that I have a lot of them memorized and I have a lot of them internalized. So when I see something, I usually can recognize if it's a, a, a bargain or not. I've recently purchased some copy, um, it's not part of this episode, but um, the Max is a series that I've just recently gotten into, in particular because of the recommendations of a couple of people who are on this chat, as well as a couple of videos uh, that I watched online. And I've been picking up copies of the Max Maximized, and these are uh, oversized but thin hardcovers. I love thin hardcovers, and they're oversized thin hardcovers of the Max. And I, I I thought that they wouldn't be available here at all. So the fact that I've been able to get them for 20% of US list price, it's like, I don't care. You know, it's like some people might say, well, that's a lot of money for something that is four issues or five issues, et cetera. It's like, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's a it's an oversized hardcover. So sometimes it's about list price. And uh, when you got to read, you got to read. Yeah, I understand those kind of things. Uh, don't you have problems storing all these books, termites? No, no, I don't. I don't have termites. I mean, I hope I don't have termites. No, but um, you get termite treated shelves. I mean, that's one of those things and you keep cleaning the shelves. So from time to time, you should take your books out and vacuum. I have a video on how I clean my bookshelves in case you are interested in, in how I approach that. But yes, I think the the nightmare of termites, I had a friend who got to their volumes of Absolute Sandman one day and they'd been eaten inside out. Like the covers, they looked like they still existed as books. But when you pull them out, it, it was hollow inside because of termites. And like ever since I heard that story, it's like, but no, I have, I have no problems. I Dust is, you know, it's an issue with everyone, I think. Um, cover price... Newspaper comics. Yeah, see, I think as far as looking for deals, um, you just got to spend a lot of time hunting. I mean, you just got to spend a lot of time online uh, looking at various sources. I used to be a lot more, I, I used to be, uh, I used to have an Excel sheet in which I had different tabs for, you know, what is it on Amazon? What's it on Flipkart? What's it, all these various websites that I have? And then I would have US sites and how much shipping costs and all of those kind of things. I've stopped buying from the US almost completely. It's just, it's not worth it with um, with import prices and duties and shipping and things like that. And uh, in India, uh, every now and then you can have sales. And I think what happens is sometimes people are clearing out stock. Uh, it's getting rarer, um, but I buy almost exclusively online. I know people who go to bookstores have found good deals and people who spend time out in the market, at least before uh, COVID, um, would find fantastic deals. So I, I think it's the more legwork you put in and the more um, elbow grease you put in, the more the rewards are there. I just draw the line somewhere. It's just like, I can't be, you know, I can't be bothered. So sometimes I will, you know, I know it might be cheaper if I went out, although I, I doubt it, but I'm just, I'm just going to look for it. So I, I add things to my shopping cart and I leave them there and I wait for a notification that the price has dropped and stuff like that. It's not, it's not, it's not really very scientific. It's more, you have an idea of what you're willing to pay for something. And then the wish list usually the wish list is always so big that you're never not going to have something to buy. So if you're not getting that because it's too expensive, you'll get something else. The, the maybe, maybe this is a different way of looking at things. But I mean, how you budget for buying comics and how you buy comics is 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 a completely different episode in itself. You know how people do it and how different people do it. I'd love to know how people prioritize. And I I just I have a monthly budget and I choose every month. And when I hit the top of that budget. When I hit the top of the budget, I usually go a little over that. But after that, you know, that's done. And now you wait for next month. So as a salaried uh, person, um, that's the way you do it. You kind of just have those things in there. And 
uh, a good segue into Pogo. This Pogo box set has been on my wish list forever. And um, it was very expensive. So as much as I love Pogo, which is, again, from the 1940s uh, comics, uh, uh, it ran for, I think, until the 1970s, 1975 by Walt Kelly. Pogo is a fantastic comic um, that has influenced a lot of people. Like we were talking about Calvin and Hobbes earlier. Bill Watterson um, was very influenced by Pogo. Uh, Goscinny and Uderzo, um, the creators of Asterix comics, were very influenced by Pogo. Um, Jeff Smith's Bone is almost a direct tribute to Pogo in certain ways as far as the the, the, the figures of the born cousins are concerned. Um, there's, there's Alan Moore's Swamp Thing had a Pogo-inspired uh, story. And uh, the uh, it's, it's a very interesting, it's a very laid back sort of comic strip. It's a, uh, ha, ah, Tushar, thank you. Super chat. And I, uh, you know, I think, I think this comic book not a lot of people in India talk about it, and I'm surprised because it is such a fantastic comic book, and it has such a beautiful uh, reproduction. Once again, from uh, Fantagraphics, MVP of uh, this episode, at least. But I mean, they do a really good job uh, bringing out these sort of collected editions of uh, classic comics. And Pogo being such an influential comic on so many people that I love, uh, and and the kind of storytelling that's there, it's 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 kind of warm and fuzzy, and at the same time it has social satire, it has political, uh, and this this is one of those things with the with the um, uh, with the daily newspaper strips. I mean, they're often they can be uh, very current they can be commenting directly on the headlines of that day but pogo set as it is in a swamp with animal characters you know there's almost no humanoid or human type of characters they're all animal characters and clothes etc is is uh, is one of the most gentle satires uh, that i've read so this box set is actually volumes 3 and 4 of pogo those of you who've watched my um bookshelf videos will see that I got the All right this is it's going to be edited out maybe um, um, I got volume one and two in a box set ages ago I think maybe five years ago and I, I really enjoyed it and um, it took a long time for volume three and four to come out I think volume three might have come out a couple of years ago but volume four took a long time to come out or uh, or something but this box set putting volume three and four together was extremely expensive it was like double the price for some reason in in india that uh, that that it was in the united states so as much as i wanted it um uh, i wasn't i wasn't biting the bullet and also i thought that i could always get these books you know like the individual volumes which is what happened with me uh with the uh, peanuts it's what's happened with me with uh, the Karl box volumes is that the books themselves are usually they don't go out of print or they don't become unavailable it's the box if you must have the box if you must put it into a box set that that becomes difficult to find so i was kind of reconciling myself to the fact that all right you know what pogo three and four is not going to be in a box. I know one and two is in a box and somewhere you've got that thing, no, I'm going to have boxes on the thing. It was like, but well, okay, it's not. And then the price fell. And I, I, I don't know why it fell. I have no idea uh, why, but it didn't fall to like a bargain uh, price. But I was like, okay, I can, I can get the box. But I was, but I would have gotten the, I would have gotten the books. I mean, they're just, they're fantastic. And I'll try and show, by the way, this cover is, these covers for the boxes and for these volumes are, not um they're not walt kelly illustrations i wonder if anyone <laughs> here's a quiz for you uh, arvind ramanathan thank you so much thank you keep up the great work thank you so much this is uh, this is fantastic i really really appreciate it this uh, can anyone try to identify who the artist is of uh, of this cover art this is inspired by Walt Kelly. It's very faithful to Walt Kelly, but it is painted art created specifically 
for uh, this box set and these volumes. And it is someone uh, who we've talked about on this channel before. Um, I'm, it, it, I'm going to show you this book. This is Dust Jacketed. Uh, someone had a really interesting question of what is the purpose of dust jackets? They just seem to be more bothered than anything else. And I, and I understand, and it's absolutely true. They are because they're not what they used to be at one point of time, but you know, I still love them <laughs> because they're there. And if they're not there, I, uh, this is the, this is the design of the book without the dust jacket. Embossed. and newspaper strips. Beautiful expressive art, wonderful cartooning, great characters, very funny, very heartfelt, very, as the kids say these days, wholesome, um, but also, uh, as I said, quite biting uh, when, it, uh, when, it, when it wants to be, but in, in, in the gentlest of ways. This is uh, artwork by Linda Medley, by the way, of Castle Waiting fame. And so this is volume three and four of Pogo. I think there's going to be a total of 12 volumes. Um, volume seven is coming out at the end of this year. That means five and six as a box set should have been announced already. Um, well, <laughs> let's see how long that takes to get here. And uh, at a reasonable price, I'm not holding my breath. And that's one of the problems, I think, uh, especially for people outside the United States for these kind of things, which is also the case for people outside of Europe for fantastic European editions. Although the European editions are very tempting from the production point of view, but if they're not in English, they're less tempting, obviously. You know, I mean, like it looks fantastic, but if it's not in English and I can't read it, uh, I'm not that tempted. So therefore, I mean, I don't mean to focus only on American editions, but English language is, is an important thing. The thing about the handsomest, most beautiful volumes of such collected um, you know, comics things for us in India is they're the hardest to ship. They're the most expensive books. Uh, there, so therefore, they will have the most ex the customs and duties are always a percentage of whatever the value is. So if it's fifty dollars, it's thirty five percent of fifty dollars instead of thirty five percent of ten dollars. So that's one thing. Then the 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 weight uh, adds to the shipping uh, costs and then the possibility of damage. So then you've got this doubt. Like if I'm going to pay fifty dollars, if I'm going to pay a hundred dollars for something that is a luxurious collection, a collector's edition, etc. I don't want it dented and scratched in the way that I'm fine with a TPB, you know, which is $15 marked down to 11 with a crease on the cover, so on and so forth. But to me, the way that these last and the things and what's most important is there is no trade paperback of Pogo and there's not going to be 12 volumes of, uh, you know, uh, Pogo trade paperbacks. There's not going to be um, 36 trade paperback volumes of um, the Karl Marx books, although although I might be wrong about that, there were there were trade paperback or paperback volumes of the Peanuts uh, editions, which again, I can't recommend that series highly enough, uh, the complete Peanuts library. But these, uh, these editions uh, in hardcover reproduced so well are, are gorgeous and beautiful. So therefore, I'm still going to wait and save my money and then try and see whether I can get, you know, uh, five and six in the box set. If seven comes out at the end of this year, um, eight next year, who knows when? Because, I mean, just how long it took for three and four to become available. I'm glad to see that five and six is already available. Uh, but they're gorgeous books. Yes, they're beautiful books. They're beautifully produced. Uh, but the story, uh, you know, Pogo is really one of the most uh, charming comics you can read, which is why I always feel surprised that not, you know, because, uh, okay, Godfredson is 1930s, maybe a little bit more, uh, but Pogo lasted till the 1970s. And I hear a lot of people talk about uh, Karl Marx, of course, uh, not not enough people talk about Walt Kelly, in my opinion. I think, I think Walt Kelly's Pogo
I think Walt Kelly's Pogo is really one of those kind of undersung uh, masterpieces, at least uh, in in conversation that I'm involved in on a regular basis, which is why I love the fact that uh, Fantagraphics has this. Of course, Fantagraphics does do this with many, many um, series, and many of the series are ones that I'm not familiar with. Most recently, I've become interested in Hal Foster's Prince Valiant, and I have seen those Fantagraphics books out there for many years i did pick up one volume which i got on sale it's like the thing i was talking about earlier is you find something at a low price uh, even if it's used even if it's scuffed you pick it up to see whether it appeals to you and i picked up one of those large hardcover i i i showed it in one of my recent reads videos and it was gorgeous and that was volume 12 so i was like oh i've got to start from volume 1 because i want to see how how this started out but you can you can jump in in the middle of something and just to taste it just to see how it is and uh, fantagraphics has done this with so many series has done this with so many people that this, this is obviously never going to be it's never going to be complete it's never going to be comprehensive uh, my collection abilities so you're going to pick and choose uh, what i'd like to know is um, is 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 what you guys think of um, of, of, of these kind of box sets. I know that a lot of people read digitally and I know that a lot of people uh, obviously have no choice because not, not everyone's going to spend thousands and thousands of rupees on, on uh, you know, two volumes on something, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but even with reading digitally, I think I know people who read digitally in order to decide what they're going to buy physically. You know, it's, it's sort of that sampling sort of thing. What I do with used and torn books or secondhand and uh, the, that, that kind of stuff. And how do, how do you make your decisions? Because sometimes I'm just like, I'm glad I picked up the first volume of Barks because then I was just like, okay, I'm going to get, get every one of these. And it's kind of the way I feel about Pogo as well. Even if I don't get boxes, they're so well made and they're such a pleasure to read. And that's another one of the reasons why um, I'm not a big fan of huge omnibuses is because they, they're, they're beautifully produced, but that pleasure to read part of it gets diminished. Like I, I'm never pulling it off the shelves and never sitting down with it. Whereas, you know, one of these Archies... Um, not a problem. I mean, well, I mean, it's so. Uh, this is uh, this is easy to read. You can read this. You can read this in bed. You know, you can you can read this with one hand uh, because of the way it's uh, because of the way it's made, uh, the way it's produced. It's hardcover, you know, uh, but but that it's easy, and uh, that pleasure um, for something like this. I mean, and I'm sure you can say that that exists for this paperback as well. well not really. I mean. There's, It'll get you, it'll get you, yeah, I keep opening the same, I keep opening to this page because it's the, it's split and torn and all that stuff. It's, uh, this, this is probably a bad example. And I still like this book because it told me where to go. But um, yeah, that's why, that's why I like, uh, that's why I like the collected editions. Uh, I like the publishers who bring them out. I like the formats that they're brought out in. I like the respect given to them, uh, especially if they're things that I'd, not heard of before and then I read them in this format and I'm like I get it now I understand why it is um, you know why it is the way it is Little Orphan Annie yes that's one of the ones that I've you know I've, I've, I've read at a friend's place uh, but I've never I've never uh, owned any Little Orphan Annie I did um, Cole Clauser had a book called uh, Little Tommy Lost which was sort of an Orphan Annie pastiche which I thought was fantastic um, but not not the original itself um, cherry blossom, Kindle. Yes, that's a you know. I mean, I I think the that that's that's what I think about e-reading, about digital, about comic book reader. I think these give people an opportunity to try out things uh, in you know in in ways that were unimaginable. Um, can you make these live sessions a regular thing? Yeah, well, yeah. I I mean, people seem to be enjoying it, so that's great. I'm I'm very. Uh, I'm very surprised, but uh, very, very pleased as well. Um, I'm thinking that I must have missed a lot of chat stuff. I'm sorry. I, I, I've not done this before, and this, I didn't expect this much chat to be up there, but uh, I think that... Uh, but you guys are talking amongst yourselves, which is very, you know, it's just, just talk, discuss. Yeah, I, I can throw that out there. Uh to Vianneson's moments. Yes, I have the uh, the drawn and quarterly complete to Vianneson 
which I've been meaning to make a video on. I've just not found the proper format for it because I didn't know anything about movement. I thought they were all comics. Then I realized that, no, there are illustrated books and comics and the comic strip is different from the illustrated book. And that part was just like, oh no, now what do I need to do? Do I need to read the illustrated books as well? Or should I just do it on the comics? So yeah, I, I mean, shorts, in, in short, great, but yes, uh, uh, definitely, definitely something that I need to create uh, um, life and time of Scrooge McDuck. Again, if if you've not read any um, Scrooge stories, Don Rosa's Life and Times of Scrooge McDuck is a twelve-part story that's fantastic. It it is based on the works of Karl Barks, who came before Don Rosa, but it's definitely one that's a great one to start from. Oh, the only thing would be that it's almost so good that it would be difficult to read something after that. And if you expect that to be uh, the case every single time, it's just such a good story and it fills in a lot of stuff that happens in between the stories. So um, maybe you read Karl Barks and you read Don Rosa back and forth. Maybe that's the way to do it. Um, um, sure. Um since we cannot buy all the comics out there, who says we can? <laughs> yeah. Uh, what are your uh, on reading comics online for free? Well, here's the thing about for free, because usually I think uh, when people say for free, they mean in pirated form. And I'm not going to lecture anybody on anything, but I am personally, I'm not a fan of pirated reading. Uh, it's, just, it's just not... Uh, it doesn't work for the creators. It doesn't work for, and I think there are some cases where, I mean, it depends on how you define piracy, right? So if you take something that is old and out of print and absolutely ungettable and someone has PDF scans of it, yes, I don't, I don't consider that piracy because you're not, but I think there are a lot of other justification systems that people come up with. So again, I'm not going to get into it in a deep way, but reading for free, if it is free because the publisher or because the creator has put it out there for free. Reading digitally is one thing. Reading pirated is a different thing. They often go hand in hand. So I don't know. Um, also, I work in publishing, so I have a vested interest in this that I have, uh, you know, I'm just letting you know the bias is um, if you read pirated books, there are going to be fewer books of quality up there. I mean, I would like to think that somewhere, somewhere, some publisher gets to keep making uh, some, you know, box set like this because someone as ridiculous as me pays money for it. So if I didn't, and that's the other thing about box sets, and it's a very interesting thing because uh, there's no point in pirating a box set. You know, you can pirate comic, uh, which is a comic or a book or something like that. The box set is more than just those panels. Uh, so I don't know. I, I don't know if I'm answering the question correctly, but I, I would recommend that you read what you can afford to read. And yes, if you can read by borrowing from friends who have bought it, it's not the same thing, you know, because this, there's a thing about scale. There's a question of mechanism. There's a question of, so I know all the justification that people say, well, me reading a PDF is the same as me borrowing it from a friend. And it's not me reading a PDF is the same thing as me buying a used book. It's not, it's about the industry and it's about what you uh, fuel. So I don't, I wouldn't ever tell people to go and read something pirated. I would say read it digitally to find out if you want to buy it physically. And I would say read it digitally if that's the only way you can read it. It's not the same thing as read it for free necessarily. Um, I don't know if that's, a, I don't know if that's a good answer or uh, what you were looking for. Um, IDW Little Law for Nanny, I'm going to have to put that on my list. Um, Buying secondhand books doesn't give money to artist or publisher. No, it doesn't. But it's kind of like listening to someone on the radio doesn't give, um, you know, because if you're going to pirate one thing, you're going to pirate more than one thing. There's nobody who reads only one thing on PDF. They, it becomes a habit or it becomes a system. And that's what I mean by a system. Buying a used book means that you will buy a new book. It's, I mean, it's just, it's a truth of behavior, at least from what I've seen as a reader and as a publisher. Um, you can buy exclusively used books, but even used books are an industry that's fueled by the publication of books, by the legal. So it's a first right doctrine. So it's kind of like, 
I know it's not the same thing as a car or a house, you know, because there's, but, but that's just about whether value goes up or down. A used book can be more uh, expensive than what it was at list price. It just depends on whether it's out of print, whether it's rare, whether the market. So that's a different kind of market force. So it's not quite the same thing as uh, reading a pirated book. A pirated book means that I'm going to do away with all of this industry in order to focus on this. And that is eventually going to lead to the um, drying up of that industry, or it's going to only the thing that can survive in spite of piracy. So that means all you will have is, I don't know, you know, like blockbuster movies, because they have enough money in spite of the piracy. You're not going to have the indie movies because they require every cent they get. So it really, it really depends. I mean, if you think that, oh, I only pirate Michael Bay movies and Michael Bay's got enough money or I only pirate Metallica albums and Metallica's got enough. I mean, that's one way of looking at it. Um, but it, it doesn't even have to be the most indie level. Uh, anyway, this is a big complex question and I do, I do have a, a very, um, uh, detailed thoughts on it, but I love to discuss this with people. So maybe that can be, maybe we can have uh, live stream discussions about certain topics. So maybe you can let me know what topics we should have uh, discussions on. Oh, wow. This has been going on. <laughs> this has been going on for a while. Uh, maybe you can let me know what kind of topics you'd like to have discussions on, because I think these are interesting uh, questions. I think these are, you know, and I, I, I really don't want to come across as lecturing anybody or telling anybody what they should do or how they should do it and uh, you know and I'm and I'm more than willing to listen to people's point of view on 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 a lot of different things but when it comes to things like piracy uh, I have particular strong opinions because I think art uh, and I consider these things art and I consider writing and drawing comics to be an artistic pursuit I think art needs to pay for itself. You know, I mean, that's, it, it can't be patronage. It can't be, um, it, it, and that requires certain business models. So I think eroding those business models or hacking away at those business models because you make certain practices every day means that that is not going to survive or it means a certain kind of it is not going to survive. That's a, that's a, that's a very simple kind of um, uh, truth that I've, seen in anything as far as a business is concerned. It, of course, depends on volume. It depends on scale. It depends on pricing. It depends on distribution. There are a lot of things out there. But the manner in which we uh, go after, <laughs> the manner in which we go after certain things that we say we love um, has to be more than just consumption only of one kind. It has to be consumption of a kind that ensures that that thing uh, can exist, can thrive even, you know, not just survive, uh, which is what which is what I want to see, which is what I'd like to see. I'd like to see artists uh, not, you know, live off their art or something like that, live off money that they make from their art, which is only going to be a place, a thing that we explore if we don't think about piracy as an option at all, is my point of view. It's like, because it's difficult to not pirate, I'm going to have to create another solution. And that, what what is that solution? You know, I mean, is it the 99 cent song download? Whatever it is. I mean, I don't know. Um, but that's not going to come across how oh, people can say you solve it for me and then I'll stop pirating maybe but I, I don't know let's see um no no I, I understand yes I, I I think because people say free I think free can mean a lot of different things but also I don't mean this about your question in particular I mean this in general I mean obviously I went off on a on a, on a tangent of my own but it's a good thing I think you know I'll just leave it at this is that uh, a long time ago when we were talking about music piracy you know um, music piracy doesn't affect today in the year 2020 music piracy does not affect LP sales music piracy does not affect the sales of, you know, someone might say that, look, you know, this uh, 20 CD Eric Clapton box set got pirated as MP3 format or something like that. And it's like, maybe, you know, or this Criterion uh, edition. Um, but if you, if you wanted the Criterion edition for the remaster, that compressed file format isn't going to give you what you wanted. So maybe that's not the best example, but the LP is the LP. So now if I think about, so maybe one of the ways of combating piracy is to say that, all right, there are going to be certain things that should be 
you know, $1 digital Kindle comics and everyone will buy it at a dollar. And it shouldn't be $5 for a single issue of paper, et cetera. So let's have the nichest of niche things. So let's have a Pogo box set that it doesn't matter whether you pirate it because the people who want the box set want the box set. That, that file isn't going to give them what they crave. The people who want the LP want the LP for other reasons than just the, the sound that comes out of the speakers only, or maybe the quality of the sound is different. But the point is, maybe your uh, products will bifurcate. But, um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Let's, uh, le let me think about it <laughs> some more. Um, okay. All right. Well, I think, I think this is a good place to wind down. I, I, do, I do like this idea of a live stream q and I think that's a really good idea. So maybe what I'll do is like this, I'll do one of the questions that I have from Q&A and I'll go back and forth between the questions that I received at that video. So if you haven't seen that video, it's the one where I invite uh, questions. Um, three or four videos ago, I think, um, your inputs. Uh, and leave me your questions over there and I'll, I'll, I'll do it in which I talk about those questions and I have the chat on and I look at uh, the live stream at the same time. I think uh, this, is, this is fun. It's very unexpected. It's very gratifying. Thank you so very much. I've had a fantastic time. I hope you guys had a good time. I did not intend for it to go on for two hours and I think I've been talking a blue streak over here but uh, thank you so much thank you very very much i hope you enjoyed this look at the thing sorry about the lights but i think we ended up with a nice dramatic compromise eventually and uh, let me know if you'd like to see any more of uh, these books uh, maybe i can put some photographs up on our facebook page or on the youtube uh, community page um yeah <laughs> mood lighting indeed thank you so much guys and have a nice rest of the weekend for those of you who aren't at Sunday night already. And I'll see you at the next video. Bye.